This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Clinton Thurber. We've heard a lot this weekend about PFA. It's reached a fever pitch. As we know in medicine, fevers are not always a good thing. We don't always think clearly. I'm joined today by Christopher Liu from New York Presbyterian Cornell and Dr. Thomas Deering from Piedmont in Atlanta. Thanks for joining me, gentlemen. Glad to be here. Great to be here. We would like to talk a little bit about maybe slowing this train that's run away about PFA. You guys were, were um, co-authors among a, a larger group on an article that was published in Heart Rhythm Journal just a couple months ago. We talked a, about a couple of things in that article, but let's first kind of hit the clinical, um, you know, some of the clinical concerns that we should discuss and safety and efficacy and things like that. Dr. Dickey. Thank you very much. You know, it was an important study, that, uh, that at least I think our study was. But basically, when looking at efficacy, you know, the original data from, you know, the PFA studies that were non-randomized showed that the efficacy was reasonable. But then when the controlled studies were done, we actually saw that there was no difference between efficacious outcomes, whether you use traditional thermal-based ablation or whether you use the new approach. Uh, and ADVENT was the classic st uh, best study to do that, and it demonstrated, again, no benefit for PFA. So I think what we have to say is that on an efficacious basis, it's equivalent. When we look at it from the secondary point of view, which is safety, and when we're looking at one of these technologies, those are re really the two things that we think are most important. If you look again at safety from a meta-analysis and from the manifest registry, you know, safety was low. That was good. But then again, when you look to comparative studies like ADVENT, the safety was again low, but it was no different. So in appropriate hands that is experienced operators, the safety and efficacy benefit really hasn't been shown to be out there. And I think that's one of the reasons why we need to take a little bit of a deep breath. Chris, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, and I really thank you, Tom, for really taking leadership on this because, of course, with new technologies, we always want to be excited about something new. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at a new technology, we have to set the bar as in, why are we going to a new technology? Is it really better or is it doing the same? And if it's doing the same, then that's what we should say. And so, uh, you know, the, one of the main uh, concerns about safety for thermal ablation is, of course, esophageal injury, collateral damage. Uh, the benefit for pulse field ablation at this point is primarily based on animal studies, and uh, clinical trials have not shown uh, benefit in terms of safety profile. And so we have to just be honest with that and say, well, what is the actual risk from thermal ablation that we're trying to address with pulse field ablation? I think that's well said. The safety and efficacy benefits have not been proven, and when it's taken, you know, into other ablation situations that are not related to AFPAPI ablation, there are concerns. They're anecdotal, you know, stories, but there are concerns, and the different ways in which the pulse uh, energy can be delivered and the duration, those all need to be worked out, don't you think? Oh, absolutely, and so as you uh, have started to mention, uh, there can be unanticipated complications from new energy sources like right. pulse field ablation. And so the questions about hemolysis, renal failure, uh, and about coronary vasospasm, uh, there are questions that thermal ablation might cause also coronary vasospasm, but uh, this is definitely something that has been recognized for pulse field ablation. And so and there could be other un unanticipated uh, complications that we simply don't know about and won't know about until a larger uh, generalized use is, has been shown. There's so much promise from the preclinical studies. We were all so excited because the promise was this is so cardioselective, nothing else is gonna be damaged, nerves, blood vessels, esophageal tissue. Um, it, hasn't, it you know, hasn't quite reached what we hoped it would, um, as well as efficacy like we discussed. But even this weekend, we've heard of some new um, concerns about possible safety issues. We've even shown, um, been shown some temperature rises. There is maybe a thermal effect as well, despite the pulse field uh, electrical currents that we're putting there. So, you know, uh, jury's, jury's still out, I think, but maybe a pause is prudent here. Um, beyond just the clinical side, we have to consider operational variables and, um, you know, particularly in a U.S. landscape, there are some unique aspects to our healthcare system um, that we should think about. And you guys mentioned this in the article too. Chris, do you know um, some of yes. these might? <clears throat> yes, of course. So one of the main uh, selling points for pulse field ablation is increased procedural efficiency. So yes, uh, several of the studies have shown faster procedural times generally with pulse field ablation compared to traditional thermal ablation, especially radiofrequency. Uh, 
But at the same time, the, uh, these new techno technological systems are definitely more, uh, uh, cost more. And so uh, from people I've talked to, the systems cost somewhere between two to four times the current cost of thermal ablation systems. And so as we think about efficiency and the business of electrophysiology and uh, how healthcare can be sustainable in the long run, we have to take fiscal responsibility as clinicians. And besides uh, evaluating the clinical efficacy and safety, we have to look at the fiscal responsibility and the operational, the, the true operational efficiencies to be gained. So if you need to do pulse field ablation for pulmonary vein isolation, and in the ADVENT study, more than 20% of patients in each arm needed at least an, a CTI flutter ablation that then required radio frequency or certainly a second catheter to be used. And so once you account for things like that, uh, is the uh, cost of effectiveness still there? Is the operational efficiency maintained? What do you think, Tom? No, I think you said it very nicely, Chris. I think also, you know, the shorter times that you have with the procedure, so for example, you know, I think it was 17 minutes less than the ADVENT study, but it was still, you know, all 105 minutes, and it got down to 65 minutes in, uh, uh, you know, in another analysis. That's still, you know, only part of the whole process. When you go to the lab, you've got setup, you've got, you know, breakdown, you've got turnaround, et cetera. And if you can't get in another case that is, you know, positive in terms of economic or life lifestyle issues, then you're not really going to be able to do much. And we haven't proven that in the real world. That's one of the things that I think we need to be able to move it forward to. The other thing I think we need to look at fiscally, and you said it very nicely, Chris, is, you know, over half the hospitals in the United States in the past year actually ran a negative contribution margin. And when we take a procedure that is actually positive and helps them to do their other mission, and we remove that from a positivity to a neutral or even a negative, we actually not only hurt our patients, we hurt patients across the broad because the institutions don't have the capability of doing that. So I think we need to have a conversation with the vendors, with our administrators, and with clinicians about how we go forward. We just don't want to be kids in the candy store looking for the best treat, but we also really, like you said, Chris, need to show fiscal responsibility, our administrators do, and those who sell this particular product also need to do that. It's such a complex, multifaceted issue, and there's so many of those that need to be defined, I think. You know, there's some thought that as we, as our learning curve improves, maybe efficiency improves to such an extent that you do fit in that extra case. Um, or as we change parameters, maybe with the catheters, the delivery, the pulse width, all these different things, maybe obviously will change the actual uh, response of the esophagus or the actual tissue. And so all that remains to be defined, I think. Um, but we love to speculate about this kind of thing. That's what's fun about it, right? So yep. where do we see the future going? What do you think, Chris? Well, I mean, look, so I think uh, just, again, piggybacking on what Tom just said about the kids in the candy store, I think this is why it's so important to have these conversations in the open because there are so many sessions going on that are promoting this technology. And of course, we do want to get excited. We do thank and really appreciate the innovators, the disruptors, our teachers who are really exploring and trying to do things better. This is how electrophysiology was built as a field and this is what we need to continue to do. At the same time, we need to really look at, well, what is it that we are getting here? Is thermal ablation really such a problem that we need a new solution? So uh, it is a radio frequency catheter, something that I would otherwise be completely comfortable recommending for my patients. Let's say pulse field ablation did not exist today. Would we not be doing these AFib ablations? It's a great point. And so I think that's a good question to ask. And you know, part of the reason I think for us to have this conversation on Heart Rhythm TV is to really, I think, help our colleagues understand those of you maybe in the silent majority who don't yet have pulse field ablation and are reluctant to get it or start using it, you are not alone and you are not crazy. I Chris, it. I think you said that very well, and I think that's a good closing out comment. I think what we need to do going forward is realize, just like you said, we need to get more data on those questions to prove efficacy is better, not to speculate it is, and to prove safety remains irrespective of where we apply this catheter. I also think we need to put all the stakeholders together, like I said earlier, and we need to roll up our sleeves and we need to have frank, honest conversations. And like you said, Chris, I think engaging everybody here on IHRS TV to have a debate and a discussion and you know raise controversy 
democracy is really key. If we just go up the stairs on an escalator, we're just going to get there smoothly. We will take two steps forward and a step back. We will go one step forward and four steps back. But we've got to go forward overall. But we have to realize it will not be progression in a linear, always positive fashion. We will have setbacks that will allow us to regroup, figure out where our mistakes were made and what opportunities we have and go forward. So I don't think we've solved this process. It is a great potential. But right now, as we summarized at the end of that article that we wrote, we said this is an evolutionary process, not a revolutionary process. At least that's the way I would leave it. And well, speaking so. of that article, we're going to link it to our publication here. I encourage everyone to check it out, published in Heart Rhythm Journal, March of this year. Again, thank you, Dr. Deering and Dr. Liu, for joining me. You guys have been watching Heart Rhythm TV. Until next time.